Hello. Welcome to Campfire and Fables. Associated with our PG Stories project. Sit back and relax. Enjoy watching the fireplace while listening to this episode of storytelling. A practice that has been done since man's discovery of fire. We start with one of the famous authors who has captured the imaginations of such time, of fire and savagery. Robert E. Howard. The father of sword and sorcery, and the creator of the legendary Conan the Barbarian. Conan, a tall man, mightily shouldered and deep of chest, with a massive corded neck and heavily muscled limbs. He was clad in silk and velvet, with the royal lions of Aquilonia worked in gold upon his rich dupon, and the crown of Aquilonia shone on his square-cut black mane. But the great sword at his side seemed more natural to him than the regal accoutrements. His brow was low and broad, his eyes a volcanic blue that smouldered as if with some inner fire. His dark, scarred, almost sinister face was that of a fighting man, and his velvet garments could not conceal the hard, dangerous lines of his limbs. Originated in pulp magazines, Conan has since been adapted to books, comics, films, television, video games, RPG and tabletops. Robert Howard created the character in 1932 for a series of fantasy stories published in Weird Tales magazine. The first was in the December issue, volume 20 number 6 with, The Phoenix on the Sword. The Phoenix on the Sword by Robert Irvin Howard Know, O Prince, that between the years when the oceans drank Atlantis and the gleaming cities, and the years of the rise of the sons of Aryas, there was an age undreamed of. When shining kingdoms lay spread across the world like blue mantles beneath the stars, Nemedia, Ophir, Brithunia, Hyperborea, Zamora with its dark-haired women and towers of spider-haunted mystery. Zingara with its chivalry, Koth that bordered on the pastoral lands of Shem, Stygia with its shadow-guarded tombs, Hyrcania whose riders wore steel and silk and gold. But the proudest kingdom of the world was Aquilonia, reigning supreme in the dreaming west. Hither came Conan, the Cimmerian, black-haired, sullen-eyed, sword in hand, a thief, a reaver, a slayer, with gigantic melancholies and gigantic mirth. To tread the jeweled thrones of the earth under his sandaled feet. The Nemedian Chronicles Chapter 1 over shadowy spires and gleaming towers lay the ghostly darkness and silence that runs before dawn. Into a dim alley, one of a veritable labyrinth of mysterious winding ways, for masked figures came hurriedly from a door which a dusky hand furtively opened. They spoke not but went swiftly into the gloom, cloaks wrapped closely about them, as silently as the ghosts of murdered men they disappeared in the darkness. Behind them a sardonic countenance was framed in the partly open door, a pair of evil eyes glittered malevolently in the gloom. Go into the night, creatures of the night, a voice mocked. Oh, fools, your doom hounds your heels like a blind dog, and you know it not. The speaker closed the door and bolted it, then turned and went up the corridor, candle in hand. He was a somber giant, whose dusky skin revealed his Stygian blood. He came into an inner chamber, where a tall, lean man in worn velvet lounged like a great lazy cat on a silken couch, sipping wine from a huge golden goblet. Well, Ascalante, said the Stygian, setting down the candle, your dupes have slunk into the streets like rats from their burrows. You work with strange tools. Tools, replied Ascalante. Why, 
they consider me that. For months now, ever since the Rebel Four summoned me from the southern desert, I have been living in the very heart of my enemies, hiding by day in this obscure house. Skulking through dark alleys and darker corridors at night. I have accomplished what those rebellious nobles could not. Working through them, and through other agents, many of whom have never seen my face, I have honeycombed the empire with sedition and unrest. In short I, working in the shadows, have paved the downfall of the king who sits throned in the sun. By Mitra, I was a statesman before I was an outlaw. And these dupes who deem themselves your masters? They will continue to think that I serve them, until our present task is completed. Who are they to match wits with Ascalanti? Valmana, the dwarfish Count of Caravan, Gromel, the giant commander of the Black Legion, Dion, the fat Baron of Atlas, Rinaldo, the hare-brained minstrel. I am the force which has welded together the steel in each, and by the clay in each, I will crush them when the time comes. But that lies in the future, tonight the king dies. Days ago I saw the imperial squadrons ride from the city, said the Stygian. They rode to the frontier which the heathen picks assail, thanks to the strong liquor which I've smuggled over the borders to madden them. Dion's great wealth made that possible. And Valmana made it possible to dispose of the rest of the imperial troops which remained in the city. Through his princely kin in the media, it was easy to persuade King Numa to request the presence of Count Tresero of Poitin, Seneschal of Aquilonia. And of course, to do him honor, he'll be accompanied by an imperial escort, as well as his own troops, and Prospero, King Conan's right-hand man. That leaves only the king's personal bodyguard in the city, besides the Black Legion. Through Gromel I've corrupted a spendthrift officer of that guard, and bribed him to lead his men away from the king's door at midnight. Then, with sixteen desperate rogues of mine, we enter the palace by a secret tunnel. After the deed is done, even if the people do not rise to welcome us, Grommel's Black Legion will be sufficient to hold the city and the crown. And Dion thinks that crown will be given to him? Yes. The fat fool claims it by reason of a trace of royal blood. Conan makes a bad mistake in letting men live who still boast descent from the old dynasty, from which he tore the crown of Aquilonia. Almena wishes to be reinstated in royal favor as he was under the old regime, so that he may lift his poverty-ridden estates to their former grandeur. Omel hates Palantides, commander of the Black Dragons, and desires the command of the whole army, with all the stubbornness of the Bassonian. Alone of us all, Rinaldo has no personal ambition. He sees in Conan a red-handed, rough-footed barbarian who came out of the north to plunder a civilized land. He idealizes the king whom Conan killed to get the crown, remembering only that he occasionally patronized the arts, and forgetting the evils of his reign, and he is making the people forget. Already they openly sing the lament for the king in which Rinaldo lauds the sainted villain and denounces Conan as that black-hearted savage from the abyss. Conan laughs, but the people snarl. Why does he hate Conan? Poets always hate those in power. To them perfection is always just behind the last corner, or beyond the next. They escape the present in dreams of the past and future. Rinaldo is a flaming torch of idealism, rising, as he thinks, to overthrow a tyrant and liberate the people. As for me, well, a few months ago I had lost all ambition but to raid the caravans for the rest of my life, now old dreams stir. Conan will die, Dion will mount the throne. Then he, too, will die. One by one, all who oppose me will die, by fire, or steel, or those deadly wines you know so well how to brew. Ascalanti, King of Aquilonia, how like you the sound of it? The Stygian shrugged his broad shoulders. There was a time, he said with unconcealed bitterness, when I, too, had my ambitions, beside which yours seemed tawdry and childish. To what a state I have fallen! 
The old-time peers and rivals would stare indeed could they see Thothamon of the Ring serving as the slave of an outlander, and an outlaw at that, and aiding in the petty ambitions of barons and kings. You laid your trust in magic and mummery, answered Ascalanti carelessly. I trust my wits and my sword. Wit and swords are as straws against the wisdom of the darkness, growled the Stygian, his dark eyes flickering with menacing lights and shadows. Had I not lost the ring, our positions might be reversed. Nevertheless, answered the outlaw impatiently, you wear the stripes of my whip on your back, and are likely to continue to wear them. Be not so sure, the fiendish hatred of the Stygian glittered for an instant redly in his eyes. Some day, somehow, I will find the ring again, and when I do, by the serpent fangs of Set, you shall pay. The hot-tempered Aquilonian started up and struck him heavily across the mouth. Thoth peeled back, blood starting from his lips. You grow overbold, dog, growled the outlaw. Have a care, I am still your master who knows your dark secret. Go upon the housetops and shout that Ascalanti is in the city plotting against the king, if you dare. I dare not, muttered the Stygian, wiping the blood from his lips. No, you do not dare, Ascalanti grinned bleakly. For if I die by your stealth or treachery, a hermit priest in the southern desert will know of it, and will break the seal of a manuscript I left in his hands. And having read, a word will be whispered in Stygia, and a wind will creep up from the south by midnight. And where will you hide your head, Thothamon? The slave shuddered and his dusky face went ashen. Enough. Ascalanti changed his tone peremptorily. I have work for you. I do not trust Dion. I bade him ride to his country estate and remain there until the work tonight is done. The fat fool could never conceal his nervousness before the king today. Ride after him, and if you do not overtake him on the road, proceed to his estate and remain with him until we send for him. Don't let him out of your sight. He is mazed with fear, and might bolt, might even rush to Conan in a panic, and reveal the whole plot, hoping thus to save his own hide. Oh! Slave bowed, hiding the hate in his eyes, and did as he was bidden. Ascalanti turned again to his wine. Over the jeweled spires was rising a dawn crimson as blood.